Hello. In this session, we're going to be talking about another childhood disease, mumps. Please note the references are the same that, that I generally use. Javits, Harrison's and Anant Narayan. So mumps virus belongs to the same family that is measles, to which measles belongs, that is paramyxoviridae. And mumps belongs to the genus Rubula virus, parainfluenza 2 and 4A and 4B also belong to the same genus. So mumps virus has a is an enveloped virus like all paramyxoviridae viruses having a helical nucleocapsid, having a single stranded RNA genome which is negative stranded. This 15 kilo base pair genome encodes eight structural proteins. Please note in this diagram the N, P and L protein at the top of this image are the ones which are associated with the RNA genome. So N is the nucleocapsid, L is the large polymerase gene and P is the phosphoprotein. So these three are associated, these are structural proteins which are associated with the RNA genome. Next is the matrix protein in short called as the M protein. This is forming a layer or it is associated with the envelope, forms a layer just beneath the lipid envelope of the mumps virus. There are two small proteins, V protein and the SH protein. These are antagonists of the host antiviral response. Coming to the two important proteins which are forming those projections or peplomers on the virus. These are the HN glycoprotein and the F glycoprotein. So first let me talk about the HN glycoprotein. This hemagglutinin neuraminidase glycoprotein antibodies against this N H HN antigen correlate with immunity and these antibodies appear around the fourth week after onset. This glycoprotein is able to agglutinate fowl, guinea pig, human and many other RBCs. Notice in this diagram when the virus is getting mixed with these RBCs you are seeing all of them getting agglutinated to each other. Now because this virus, this glycoprotein also has the neuraminidase associated with it, that is silidase activity, it leads to the reversal of agglutination because this neuraminidase destroyed, destroys the receptors to which the virus binds after some time. This leads to the reversal of agglutination which is called as elution. The F glycoprotein or the fusion glycoprotein is responsible for the entry of the virus by the fusion of the viral envelope with the host cell membrane. And this F glycoprotein leads to syncytium formation. It also has hemolysin activity. So very important fact to remember is that mumps, paramyxoviruses, both of them have the HN, uh, sorry, mumps and parainfluenza viruses have the HN and the F glycoproteins embedded in the lipid envelope. There is only one serotype of mumps virus and according to the gene sequencing of the SH gene, there are 12 genotypes, A to N, there is no E genotype or M genotype. All have the same virulence and antigenicity. In India, the genotype C is common. Mumps is a strict human pathogen endemic worldwide. The most common age group that is affected is 5 to 10 years. Mode of infection is direct contact or airborne droplets or via fomites contaminated with the patient's saliva or urine. Period of infectivity in one week before to one week after. And secondary attack rates are very high, more than 85%. And one attack of mumps leads to lifelong immunity, generally. Though there are some cases of mild mumps after few years. 30 to 50 percent of infections are asymptomatic but the patient is definitely infectious to the other via saliva and urine. Incubation period very important to remember 12 to 23 days. There is initially a prodromal malaise and anorexia then the patient presents with parotid swelling which is in generally initially unilateral goes on to become a bilateral swelling. Associated with fever, local pain as well as tenderness, but the skin over the parotids is not warm, neither is, is it erythematous. Other salivary glands like sublingual glands and the submandibular glands are also involved. But the most common ones of course are the parotids. This swelling generally resolves in one week. 30% of post-pubertal men who develop mumps also develop a complication that is epididymoarchitis, which is generally unilateral. That's a very important question to remember. That is epididymoarchitis occurs in 30% of post-pubertal males. 
This is associated with painful enlargement of the testes and this testes may undergo in 50% of involved individuals may lead to testicular atrophy. But very rarely this involvement of the testes may be bilateral and then it may lead to testicular atrophy which may lead to sterility. But remember sterility is a very rare complication of the epididymoorchitis. 5% of women develop ophritis associated. So this would present as pain abdomen. Moving on to another important involvement that is the CNS. Generally in about 50% of individuals, if we examine the CSF, it would show pleocytosis. But 10% of them will present with symptoms of aseptic meningitis, so fever, neck rigidity, head, headache, sen altered sensorium. This develops either 5 to 7 days after parotitis, so that's the most common. The patient presenting with these meningitis symptoms around after about a week of the parotid swelling. But sometimes it may occur even in the absence of the parotitis or it may precede parotitis. This complication of the CSF involvement is uh, uh, of the meningitis is more often seen in males. The CSF shows that initially the polymorphonuclear leukocytes are increased, later lymphocytosis is seen, the glucose is reduced, the proteins are raised before uh, above normal. Spontaneous resolution of this CNS involvement generally occurs. But sometimes the patient may have residual deafness which is generally unilateral. Meningoencephalitis is a very rare complication. It is seen in less than 0.1% of individuals. Pancreatitis is seen as, a seen as a complication in about 4%. Other complications include thyroiditis, myocarditis, arthritis, nephritis, keratouveitis, and there is no effect seen on pregnancy. So if mumps occurs in pregnancy, it does not lead to spontaneous abortions, etc. Neither is it teratogenic. Diagnosis of mumps, we they collect the following specimens. Saliva is collected preferably by collecting buccal swabs. This would be positive up to two, five days. Urine would be positive up, up to two weeks and CSF would be positive up to eight to nine days. After collecting the specimen, we can use cultivation, which is done on monkey kidney cell lines or HeLa cell lines. We can detect the viral growth either by heme absorption of fowl, guinea pig or human RBCs or we can detect the mumps virus antigens by immunofluorescence or we can de de detect the characteristic cytopathic effect that is syncytium formation. We can also culture the mumps virus on the chick embryo. For primary isolation we would use the amniotic cavity for we can use the allantoic cavity after we have adapted the mumps virus. So for primary isolation, meaning directly from the specimen, we will use the amniotic sac. Most sensitive method would be RT-PCR to detect the viral DNA. RNA. Serology would demonstrate a fourfold rise in antibody titer. We can either use ELISA or hemagglutination inhibition tests. For definitive diagnosis, we will detect specific IgM antibodies by ELISA. These strongly suggest recent infection. IgM antibodies generally taper in 60 days after infection. Moving on to treatment, of course, there is no specific antiviral therapy of mumps. Prophylaxis of mumps is done by giving a live attenuated vaccine which is grown in chick embryo fibroblast cell lines. The strain of the virus that is used is the Geral Lynn strain, which is attenuated by passage in eggs and then grown in chick embryo fibroblasts. This vaccine is recommended after one year of age. Contraindications, very important, pregnancy, immunodeficiencies, hypersensitivity to neomycin or egg protein. It is generally given in combination with measles and rubella, that is the MMR vaccine given subcutaneously. Let's take up some questions. A four-year-old develops an acute febrile illness, the pediatrician diagnoses mumps. The organ most commonly exhibiting signs of mumps would be which of the following? Lungs, testes, parotids, pancreas and meninges. The answer to this would be obviously parotitis, that is the non-separated swelling of the parotids. That's the most common presentation. So the answer is C. 
which one of the following statement concerning mumps is correct? So we have to find out the correct statement. Passive immunization is the only means for preventing the disease. That is not so. Active immunization in the form of the mumps vaccine is given. There is no vaccine against mumps. That is again a wrong statement. Testes, ovaries, pancreas can be involved. Yes, epididymo, orchitis, oophoritis, pancreatitis are very commonly seen in patients of mumps. This, so this seems to be the correct statement. The rest of the option, diagnosis can be made only on clinical grounds as the virus can not be grown. Of course, it can be grown on several cell lines. Second episodes of mumps can occur since there are two serotypes. There, there is only one serotype of mumps virus, though there are at least 12 genotypes. But all of them, the antigenicity is the same. So the answer to this is C. With reference to mumps, which of the following is true? Meningo encephalitis can precede parotitis. So we have to find out the correct statement. That is absolutely correct. It can very well precede parotitis. Obviously, the other statements would be wrong. Salivary gland involvement is limited to the parotids. That is not so. The patient is very well infectious in the prodromal stage. Mumps orchitis frequently leads to infertility. Again, a wrong statement. It rarely leads to sterility. So the answer to this is A. Orchitis, which may cause sterility, is a possible manifestation of which of the following? It is obviously a complication of mumps. So the answer is A. Commonest complication of mumps is which of the following? The answer is A, orchitis and oophoritis. Rarer complications are myocarditis or encephalitis. Pneumonia is hardly ever seen in mumps. Best evidence for a diagnosis of mumps is which of the following? A positive skin test, there is no such test. B, a fourfold rise in antibody treated to mumps antigen, that looks like the correct answer. IgG antibody can be rising between paired sera. History of exposure to mumps, no such thing because many infections can be asymptomatic or chitis in a young adult man. So best evidence would be B, a fourfold rise in antibodies to the mumps antigen would be the best evidence for mumps diagnosis. So to summarize the mumps virus, it belongs to the genus Rubula virus of the family Paramyxoviridae. It has eight structural proteins embedded in its lipid envelope. It has the HN and F spikes, HN hemagglutinin and neuraminidase and the fusion glycoprotein. It agglutinates fowl, guinea pig and human RBCs. There is only one serotype. Out of the 12 genotype, the genotype C is the one which is common in India. It's a non-saponative inflammation of the salivary glands. Complications, most important complications are epididymo orchitis, oophoritis, meningoencephalitis. Others include pancreatitis, thyroiditis, nephritis, arthritis, etc. Live attenuated vaccine is available. The strain that is used is the Gerilin strain. This vaccine is given subcutaneously along with measles and rubella vaccine. Thank you.